The Halloween Babysitter My name is Lori, and back in the 1980s when I was 15 years old, Halloween night was a popular evening for babysitting. I had over five different options to choose from, but opted to give my services to the first people that ever gave me a babysitting job, the Doyle family. I had babysat for them countless times. Their only child was a little girl named Annie. She was eight years old, particularly petite for her age, and cute as a button. She was a pleasure to babysit for. After Mr. and Mrs. Doyle left for their Halloween party, I dressed little Annie in her Halloween costume. She was dressed as a cupcake with sprinkles. Trick-or-treating in that neighborhood was a huge event. All of the houses were decked out in spooky glory. Spiderwebs, skeletons, ghosts, and pumpkins were out in full force. It was a great night for trick-or-treating. The air had an autumn crispness to it, but the temperature was comfortable. The neighborhood echoed with kids' laughter and the constant joyous bellow of trick-or-treat. I would stand at the end of each house's walkway and would let little Annie go up to the house herself. She was so cute waddling up to the houses in her bulky cupcake costume holding her little candy bag. At one point, as she was standing on a porch getting her bag stuffed with more candy, I noticed a man from across the street who gave me a chill. He had on a long red cloak. The hood was up over his head, but I could see his pasty face enough to notice where his eyes were directed. He was staring at little Annie. The man stood out for a couple of reasons. He was unusually tall and lean, and he was all alone. Everybody else out on the streets that night were in groups. Parents with little kids or older children clustered together. Nobody was solo, except for this man. When Annie returned to me, we moved on to the next house, and the creepy image of the tall, cloaked man left my mind. We continued hitting house after house, block after block. At one point, I ran into my boyfriend, Ben. He was out with a bunch of his friends. They were all dressed as skeletons. We chatted for a bit as Annie went up to the next house on our trick-or-treating journey. Ben and I had plans to attend a late-night Halloween party after the Doyles got back home. By the time Ben gave me a kiss on the cheek and ventured down the block with his buddies, I expected Annie to be back from her latest candy grab. But she wasn't. I turned my head to see where she was and was shocked to see her standing in the lawn. Kneeling down next to her was that creepy man in the cloak. Annie, come here. I hurried toward her as I spoke. As I approached them, I saw the lanky man running his long, slender fingers over Annie's costume. I still couldn't make out his face very well, but his skin was unnaturally pale, and it didn't look like makeup. I could hear him sniffing Annie, and heard him speak to her in a smooth, eerie voice. Mmm, you look tasty. I grabbed Annie by the wrist, and we hurried away from the ominous man. I kept an extra eye out for that creep while we finished up our trick-or-treating for the night. I kept telling myself that it was probably just a man in the neighborhood trying to add a little bit of innocent fright into the night. Yeah, that's probably all it was. Once we called it a night for our trick-or-treating adventure, we went back to the Doyle residence, and I manned the door for all the late-night trick-or-treaters in the area. At one point, when I opened the door and gave the costume kids a hefty dose of candy, something across the street caught my eye. It was him, the tall, lean, cloaked man. He was standing under a tree. He was staring at our house. Even under the shadow of the tree in the darkness of the night, I could see his pale skin glistening from under his hood. We had several more trick-or-treaters that night, and I was relieved that I didn't see the cloaked man again. It was 9.15 p.m. when I ran out of candy and turned off the porch light. 
Annie and I had just settled in on the couch and were watching a Charlie Brown Halloween cartoon when I swear I heard something outside. It sounded like someone was clawing at the windows. I got up, looked out the window, but noticed nothing unusual. The streets had gone quiet and it appeared that the last of the trick-or-treaters had called it a night. I sat back down next to Annie. About 15 minutes later the phone rang and I answered, Doyle residents. There was no answer from the other end, but I could hear breathing, heavy breathing, and it didn't sound intentional or sexual. It just sounded like heavy, natural breath. I hung up. Annie and I watched light-hearted Halloween-themed shows until 10 o'clock p.m., and then I put her to bed. It was an eventful night for her, so she was out the second her head hit the pillow. I went back downstairs to the living room, cuddled up on the couch with a throw blanket, and flipped the channel over to a scary Halloween movie. I was about 30 minutes into the movie when I noticed the silhouette of a tall figure passing by the front window. I was truly frightened and immediately picked up the phone to call my boyfriend Ben. I was going to ask him to come over and stay with me until Annie's parents got home. The phone was dead. There was no dial tone, no busy signal, nothing. It was just completely dead. I was considering going to my neighbor's house to let them know I was a little freaked out. Maybe they'd come sit with me or at least let me use their phone to call Ben. That's when I heard an unusual metallic jiggling. I followed the sound to the front door and could see the handle moving. Someone was outside trying to open the door. The Doyle house did not have a window next to their front door. In order to see who was out there, I had to walk out of the foyer and to the living room. The front window had a good view of the porch. By the time I reached the window, the jiggling had stopped. I pulled the window curtain open and peered outside, but there was nobody there. I immediately chained the front door and started checking all of the windows in the house to make sure they were all locked. When I reached a window in the back of the house in the laundry room, I noticed that the curtains were blowing. The window was wide open. Just as I closed it and locked it tight, I heard the high-pitched scream of little Annie coming from her second-floor bedroom. I raced through the house, up the stairs, and into Annie's bedroom. I had left her bedroom door open, and she told me when she woke up, she saw a tall man in the hallway. He was watching her. I rushed to Annie's bedroom door and shut it. My plan was to lock that door and just wait in Annie's bedroom until Mr. and Mrs. Doyle returned. But Annie's bedroom door had no lock. I turned off the lights in Annie's room, got Annie out of bed, and held her in my arms. I cowered down in a dark corner and tried to be as silent as I could. The hallway light was still on. My heart just about stopped when I saw the shadow of two legs standing on the other side of Annie's bedroom door. I held my breath hoping the shadow would go away, but it persisted, and then I heard what I can only describe as loud sniffing sounds. I was not going to just wait there for him to enter, so I took the initiative. I got up and ever so carefully opened Annie's second floor bedroom window. There was a small four foot ledge outside. It was just big enough for both of us to stand on. I picked up Annie, set her outside on the ledge, and then crawled out next to her. I quietly pushed the window shut just as I heard Annie's bedroom door fling open. There was nowhere for us to go from there. We were too high to jump off of the house, and the tiny ledge we were on was too low to use to get to the main roof of the house. All we could do was stand there and hope he didn't open the window and see us. Because if he did, 
he could easily reach out and grab us. We both sat there quietly, nervously. Annie was whimpering with fear, but I ran my hand down the back of her long, curly hair in an attempt to relax her. It seemed to work, and she was able to remain silent. As for me, I could literally hear my heart beating in my chest as I listened to the heavy footsteps of the intruder walking through the room. I heard the bedroom closet door being opened and the hanging clothes within being pushed about. He was searching for us. I could hear the closet door slam shut with frustration and then things were being thrown about the room as though the intruder was having a temper tantrum from not being able to find us. Then everything went silent. I was hoping he had left the bedroom, but I didn't hear his footsteps leave. After the longest time, I finally heard something. Sniffing. And then suddenly, the cloaked pale man pressed his sickly face against the window and stared directly at me. His eyes were evil and yellow. He grinned sadistically, revealing a row of pointed, shark-like teeth. He had us. There was nothing I could do as he raised up the window and reached out while sniffing eagerly. It was then that I realized he had no interest in me. He was pushing me away and reaching past me as he attempted to grab Annie. Just then, the roar of an engine echoed through the night as Mr. and Mrs. Doyle's car pulled into the driveway. The sinister, pale, cloaked man glared at me and then smashed his fists through the window, shattering the glass in anger. And then he was gone. The police did a thorough search of the house and the surrounding neighborhoods, but could find no sign of the lanky stranger. I wish I could say that this story had a happy ending, but two weeks later, little Annie went missing and was never seen again.